And there we go. Okay, so this is ideology, irrationality, and collective self-defeating behavior in Constellations, Journal of Philosophy, by Joseph Heath. For Rethius. All right. Uh, stream marker. Cool. So here we go. One of the most persistent legacies of Karl Marx and the young Hegelians has been the centrality of the concept of ideology in contemporary social criticism. The concept was introduced in order to account for a very specific phenomenon, specifically the fact that individuals often participate in, in maintaining and reproducing institutions under which they are oppressed or exploited. In the, exp in the extreme, these individuals may even actively resist the efforts of anyone who tries to change these institutions on their behalf. Clearly, some explanation needs to be given of how individuals could systematically fail to see where their interests lie, or how they might fail to pursue these interests once these have been made clear to them. This need is often felt with some urgency, since failure to provide such explanation usually counts as prima facie evidence against the claim that these individuals are genuinely oppressed or exploited in the first place. Alright, I mean, this is just getting warmed up. I'm not sure what's happening yet. There is, of course, no question that this kind of phenomenon requires a special sort of explanation. Unfortunately, Feuerbach, Marx, and their fellow followers took the fateful turn of attempting to explain these ideological effects as a consequence of irrationality on the part of those under their sway. All right, this is interesting already. Um, I don't know if you guys were here for one of the last uh, philosophy roulettes, but we had a paper where they were arguing that basically people who are oppressed are irrational. Yeah, exactly, Rethias. They didn't agree, so they were dumb. They were just getting called irrational. And it completely, one of the effects of calling things irrational is that it closes off discussion because once you're not rational, you're just dumb, you're like idiotic, or you've, you're otherwise, um, you've got problems. And so that's really one of the issues with this sort of terminology of rationality and calling something irrational. It, it basically shuts down um, analysis. And you don't want to do that because you lose um, a the ability the ability to uh, keep going and learn something new. While there are no doubt instances where practices are reproduced without good reason, the ascription of irrationality to agents is an explanatory device whose use carries with it significant costs, both theoretical and practical. In this paper, I will argue that many of the phenomena traditionally grouped together under the category of ideological effects can be explained without relinquishing the rationality postulate. Using the example of a collective action problem, I will try to show how agents can rationally engage in patterns of action that are ultimately contrary to their interests and how they can rationally resist changing these patterns even when the deleterious or self-defeating character of their actions has been pointed out to them. All right, so this this person is trying to do all the things Thanks, right sugar. here. Thank you for the follow. Thank you, uh, Natag. Um... This person is trying to do all the things right here. They're trying to say, look, you're wrong, and I'm going to show you how you're wrong, and then you are going to agree with me that I, that you are wrong, and you're going to do something about it. Now, one thing I want to notice, um, just point out real fast, is I don't know if you can see it at the bottom, but this was published in 2000. This is not a new paper. So we've got 22, maybe 23 years since this was written. Yeah, thank you, Josh. <laughs> Yeah, thanks again for the gifts up. I appreciate that. Um, so this is we've got 23 years on this paper. So maybe this paper will be spot on, but it also has 23 years of rather interesting history that it does not know about. So it's just something to point out. All right. Author says, I think that an approach such as this, one that is sparing in its description of irrationality and error, has two principal advantages. First, it allows one to engage in social criticism while minimizing the tendency to insult the intelligence of the people on whose behalf the critical intervention has been initiated. Yeah, see, this is the tough part. How do you not insult people and tell them they're wrong? Very difficult. This may reduce the tendency exhibited by some members of these groups to re reassert their autonomy precisely by rejecting the critical theory that impugns their rationality. The second major advantage is also practical. The vast majority of oppressive practices, I will argue, are not reproduced because people have false or irrational beliefs. Because of this, simply persuading people to change their beliefs has no tendency to change the underlying mechanism through which the practices are reproduced. 
Thus, the institutions acquire the appearance of being impervious to social criticism only because people have been criticizing them for so long, but nothing has changed. Correctly diagnosing the mechanism through which they are reproduced has the potential to show new strategies for social change. Okay, so it's like, how did this arise? And once you, you have to sort of disassemble like the overarching like structure that caused these bad beliefs to originate in the first place. Otherwise, they're just going to pop back up maybe in another guise. But, um, yeah, it's like you might actually correct a certain belief, but if you don't correct the way people are getting affected in, into thinking this way, you're not actually going to solve anything because everyone's just going to get caught up in the next uh, mass hysteria. And that's the thing right there. Hysteria is not the word to be using because you don't want to call people hysterical. They generally don't listen to you when you call them hysterical. Okay, ideology and irrationality. One might begin by asking what the big problem is with the assumption that people are behaving irrationally. After all, everyone knows that people make mistakes and do things without thinking. If people are acting in a way that is making their own lives miserable, it seems likely that they have fallen into some kind of error. When the peasant rallies to the defense of his feudal lord, or the hostage begins to promote the, go the goals of her kidnappers, we are likely to think that these people are behaving in a muddle-headed muddle way. We may even come up with a name for what, ha what has muddled them up, calling it Christianity or, Hel or Helsinki Syndrome. And if any of you guys are dumb Americans like me and you love Die Hard, Helsinki, Finland, right? <laughs> When they persist, yeah, exactly. This person's doing a really good job, Rethius, of not calling people stupid. Muddle-headed is uh, interesting. I kind of like uh, chuckle-headed. What was it from uh, Legally Blonde? Chuckleheads? Calling people chuckleheads? A guy at work calls everyone hamsters that he thinks is stupid. I think that's a good way. Although, someone had a pet hamster and they were really insulted that he called stupid people hamsters. But, no, he calls them gerbils. Like, you, you gerbils. I'm like, okay. I think that's pretty good, too. When they persist in this behavior, or even having been told that they are suffering from one of these ailments, we begin to think that they are not just mistaken, but that they are in the grip of some deeper form of irrationality. This diagnosis seems fairly intuitive, so what is the big problem? Hamsters <laughs> are indefensibly stupid. Nincompoop is good. Nincompoop is excellent. I like the old words like nincompoop. Um, you see uh, bamboozled on the internet. Like I like that you got bamboozled on the internet. I think that's a good uh, rehabilitation of the word bamboozled. So like a nincompoop we could use again uh, for like people who uh, are doing something silly like this. Muddle-headed is good, but I don't think it's very uh, catchy, really. Old slang had way more syllables. There was a theater. Yeah, that's the point. There was theater to it. You want the theater. That That's what gives it effect is that there's theater to it. That's why you call someone a gerbil or a uh, hamster because it gives them an image. And if like you're calling someone a nincompoop or a uh, bamboozled, then you get like more of a theater and like an imagery or a feel to it. And that's where you get the uh, meaning to your words. If you just call someone stupid, everyone knows what that means, but it doesn't, it's not very descriptive. If you call them a gerbil, it's better. Uh, troglodyte. Yeah, that's read and rap. Thanks for uh, stopping by. Um, troglodyte is good as well, but apparently it does have some rather racist origins. So you stopped using it. I didn't know it was troglodyte was racist, but yeah, I mean, it's basically calling someone, you know, before we got uh, rap, like currently humanly rational. So, but like, yeah, that is also a good thing. If you're just going to call someone stupid, you better have 100% pure emotion behind it for them to care. Exactly. There has to be more to it. But like, if you actually want to insult somebody, you make it, you make it hurt by giving people an image or some sort of like really bad thing to tie to them. If you just are calling someone stupid, there's nothing to it and you need to provide all the emotion. As Rithia said, like that's one of the problems with like curses. They get thrown around too much and eventually they're just, they lose their force. Like if I damn you to hell, no one actually thinks you're going to hell. And it's like, there's no force be behind damning anyone to hell. No one damns anyone to hell anymore because no one actually believes in hell anymore. So it's like, what does damn mean? It's just some little bit of emotion that's getting uh, vented off. But that's the thing. But if you say, if you really mean it, you have to like, and you want someone to feel it you have to do more than that just, just be like damn you to hell <laughs> like someone like look at you like you have like what are you talking about not going to hell <laughs> 
Anywho. Yeah, we can talk about curses and uh, other stuff one day. The philosophy of language likes to talk about it sometimes. I did a long time ago talk about generics. Um, about, like, you could say, like, black people are like this, or Jews are like that. And the uh, term, like, black people or Jews or whatever, like, it's just saying, like, blacks or Jews. Like, that's a generic term. And for some reason, we don't have, like, a good way of handling statements like that. And that's how you get, like, racist uh, statements. And you can also get sort of uh, insults that way that you say these people are, like, you know, one thing or another. And it's like, well, how do you deal with that? And the philosophy of language has, like, analysis of these things. So. Yeah. All right. The problem is the one raised by Donald Davidson in his famous critique of conceptual schemes. Davidson's argument is roughly as follows. There is no fact of the matter about what people mean by what they say. The meaning of their utterance is determined by the best interpretation that the hearer confers upon them. Read and rap. Yes, it is. I do a little philosophy of language sometimes, and I've read a bunch of it on uh, this uh, philosophy roulette here. The meaning of their utterances is determined by their the best interpretation that hearers confer upon them. However, the meaning that I ascribe to a person's utterances depends on a, in a crucial way upon the set of beliefs that I take that person to hold. For instance, when people talk about meeting on Thursday, I can only figure out which day they are referring to by assuming that they share with me the belief that today is Tuesday. Excuse me. If I thought they believed that today was Monday, I would start to think that they meant Wednesday when they, they said Thursday. I mean, this is like if you're talking about two days away. Let's dissect the book Sapiens. Oh, well, I don't know that book. We can look at that at some other point. But since we can only find out what people's beliefs are by asking them, and since they can only express their beliefs by putting them in form in the form of sentences that turn that in turn re require interpretation, any particular interpretation that we might confer upon a person's utterances is massively underdetermined by the evidence available to us. There are an infinite number of ways to interpret anyone's speech, each supported by the description of a different set of beliefs. Yeah, so all the things you say can be like you know, someone might say it for any number of reasons. It gets very hard to narrow down exactly what people believe, especially because people say things for different reasons. You want to get anthropological up in here? Sure. But then how do we ever understand one another? Davidson argues that all interpretations are constrained by a principle of charity. The best interpretation is the one that describes the most reasonable set of beliefs to that person. Let me just highlight this word reasonable because no one has any idea what that is. Which is to say, the one that maximizes the number of true beliefs the person is thought to hold. Yeah, no pure communication. Yeah, it's always messy. The question is how messy. And Davidson is saying it's in, it's infinitely messy, but we can maximize what we think other people are uh, saying. And in some sense, I'm always trying to maximize what the authors are saying for the Twitch audience. Like, I'm trying to get the best version of what I think they're saying so that the philosophy becomes understandable. From the standpoint of the hearer, this means that the best interpretation is the one that is consistent with the highest level of agreement between the speaker and the hearer. This requirement of charity is not a methodological assumption. It is a constitutive principle. To, inter in to interpret someone is to interpret that person charitably. If you are not interpreting them charitably, then what you are doing simply does not count as interpretation. Well, that's just wrong. I mean, of course you can uncharitably interpret them. It's you're just being a jerk face about it. I would like to point out that I added a new channel point re uh, reward called Hostile uh, Review, where I get more hostile with these people. I drop my level of charity. Like, I literally did that five minutes before stream. So... There's no binary light speed transmission from one receiver to another in perfect code. No. And even, like, if there was a super fast light speed um, thing, you'd still have to interpret it. Like, you can do the binary, but then you still have to interpret the binary. Like, zeros and ones don't carry enough information on their own. You have to in interpret, like, how you group them. And as soon as you start talking about grouping zeros and ones, it gets really messy really fast. You don't get the point? Well, we're going to see where the point is. Oh, now we have to do hostile review? Okay. I'll be less nice. That's all it is. I'm just less nice to these people. 
All right. Let's go hostile. All right, continue, but I'm just going to be meaner to this person. That's all it is. To take a real-life example of this principle in action, consider the following episode from the history of ethnography. Lucien Levy Brule infamously suggested that he had discovered the existence of pre-logical cultures. That guy's an asshole. He found that his subjects persistently made contradictory statements, incoherent observations, and generally believed false things. Later generations of ethnographers, of course, returned to these societies. Drink. Well, when you drink, you can't actually drink alcohol, so, because that would be self-harm, so I drink water. <sighs> yeah, the, the drink is a water drink. Yes, I do have channel point reward now that everyone sees that. Uh, yes, I could actually not drink beer and be smarter, but, like, I decided against that. Boo. There's your drink, Retheus. Okay. Later generations of ethnographers, of course, returned to these uh, societies somewhat skeptical about this claim and quickly discovered other ways of, of interpreting the kind of utterances that had stumped at Levy Brule, interpretations that made the natives come out sounding a lot more reasonable. Again, this word. No one has a damn clue what reasonable means. And so they, whatever they mean, this person means, is um, wrong. Like, there is no good definition of reasonable. And so, therefore, whatever this person here in this paragraph is saying, they didn't mean reasonable. They, they want to say not illogical because that was what the uh, person up here was calling them, calling them pre-logical. But what he said is reasonable is something else, and that's just wrong. For example, by distinguishing between expressions that were meant literally and those that were meant metaphorically or figuratively, a substantial portion of the contradictions Levy Brule uncovered could be dismissed. The Davidsonian point is that these later interpretations were better than Levy Brule's, not because they came closer to what the people really meant, but because they were more restrained in their descriptions of error. They were right precisely because they made the natives sound reasonable. What other evidence could there be for the correctness of an interpretation? Well, of course, sounding reasonable only means that what if you're a freaking idiot? If you are an idiot racist, you might think other people are idiot racists. And then you are saying, well, they sound reasonable to me. And so if you're an idiot racist, then other people that sound are making idiot racist things, you're going to think they are smart. What other evidence could there be for the correctness of an interpretation? I don't know. Maybe you could go ask some ex experts and figure out that. This is the problem with uh, some academics. They think they're the smartest people in the room all the time. And so when they mean, because it's reasonable to me, they mean perfectly reasonable. But like this is just a, a terrible um, way to go about uh, thinking what reasonability is. And that's why I harp on the reasonability is because no one has any fucking clue what this means. And all everyone thinks that they're the most reasonable person. That's the problem. This is how you get uh, idiots in power because uh, this is what happens in politicians they all think they're freaking geniuses and everyone who's like them is like th those are the only smart people but that's just going towards fascists like they're just turns them to fascists people who think like me are right that's what you get here yeah grumpy philosopher mode exactly that's what hostile does yeah understand cannot be measured Rithia says, I have to write learning objectives for corporate trainings, and the measurable language I think is like 80% of my job. Yeah, you can do a transfer with the software can be measured. Yeah, so like, but exactly, there are ways of doing stuff like this. And reasonable to you is not what it means. So charitability is when you're making charitability in terms of reasonability, you're going to lose. You whispered me a paper? Okay, let's see. Uh, I see. Uh, where are we? <laughs> okay. Oh, photosynthesis and chlorophyll. Cool. I got it. Yeah. So, yes, grumpy philosopher mode engaged. But, like, this is this is what I mean. It's like, you know, other otherwise, I'd be like, you know, this person should have been more precise. Now I'll be like, look, this person just flat out being going like uh this is techno fascist basically it's like you think that you're you've got the right technology you've got the right rationality you're wrong anywho 
The more general problem is this. Suspending the assumption that people are by and large reasonable and that their beliefs are predominantly true removes the only constraint that prevents one from interpreting their utterances as meaning anything at all. See, that's the problem. If you're going to go with this is the only thing that, that you charitability means anything at all is the only thing that guarantees that it means anything at all, then you're going to have a problem because then it all is coming back to this reasonability claim, which is very suspect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is what I mean. This is why I harp on the reasonable words. It's a weasel word. And every time you see it in philosophy, you can almost guarantee that the person is doing something weaselly. Um, so, and this is the problem, big jump right here. That doesn't, now on the other hand, it doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means they did a bit of a leap. And they might have left to somewhere good, but like it was big. The problem, they say, then is not that one can no longer construct a plausible explanation of their behavior, but that one can construct too many explanations and it's hard to rule any of them out. Yeah, I mean, but you're, this is just getting us back to square one in some sense. But we, we never really left that there is a... We, multiple ways of understanding people. This means that the critical theorist can only go so far in ascribing irrationality and error to people. Once she crosses a certain threshold, this ascription of error stops being an expose of their mistakes and starts to count as evidence against the proposed interpretation of their behavior. It starts to suggest that rather than having uncovered a massive all-encompassing ideology, she simply failed to understand what it is that people are doing. The interpretation that appeals less heavily to ideology than wins for ex for that very reason. Uh, okay, the interpretation that appeals less heavily to ideology than wins for that very reason. It appeals less heavily to ideology. Okay, so here's see their conclusion wasn't terrible. It's saying, look, if you don't have to rely on some big like idea of what it is to be rational and you still make sense of it, then it's fair. Then the person's still being rational, but that's more of like a baseline, you know? Since semiotic says, I would note that the entire field of ethics, and for that matter, meta-ethics, depends on moral assumptions based on intuition, about reasonableness. It is a concept we're stuck with, though imperfect. Yeah, well, I don't use it, and that's one of the reasons I'm always avoided ethics is because I was like, fuck this shit, I'm not dealing with stuff I really don't think makes any damn sense. Yeah. There are things you can measure, of course. The question is, is it exactly reasonableness? No, it'd be something else. And we can agree on certain measurable things. And Rethius, you probably actually know a lot more about the sort of things that people understand and how to measure that than I do. I've never attempted to measure people, uh, me like their uh, learning comprehension stuff and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah, so you can define certain things and then you can get somewhere. Yeah, all arguments have premises. You have to be able to start off with something. But that's exactly where this person ended up. And this is what happened. They said something stupid up here, but then when they got down here, this was not. This is not a terrible conclusion. If you have to rely less on theory and it just makes sense anyway, then it's okay. Is definable by logic is not always discoverable by logic. Yeah, that's fair. Because logic on its own doesn't tell you a whole lot. It tells you some things are contradictory and you don't want to do those things quite often. But, like, it's not going to tell you a whole lot more than that. Anyhow, much of the history of critical theory in the 20th century can be seen as an attempt to work around this problem, to find a way of advancing radical, that is, uncharitable, social criticism without having it backfire on the critic. That's a huge claim right there. <laughs> but, okay, whatever. Like, they're saying all the critical theorists are just trying to say crazy things. Well, not crazy. Radical things. Without it making them sound like they're nuts. Unfortunately, one of the things that has seldom been questioned is the very basic assumption that when people act in a way contrary to their interests, they must somehow be acting irrationally. Yeah. You're thinking of buying a truth table or two if I can afford heirloom quality? What's a, what's a truth table? Like, are those purchasable? What is that? I mean, a truth table, as far as I know, it is just like a little chart. Like you draw it on paper with like a pencil. <laughs> like, is that a product or something? Anyway, well, I, I would like to suggest that this is often not the case. While people do sometimes make mistakes and get confused, this is more the exception than the norm. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. You know, fair. <sighs> y you know, <laughs> uh, you're worried about... um. 
people making like dick jokes in chat and like people are making like sophisticated puns and I get tied up. Well, people do sometimes make mistakes and get confused. This is more the exception than the norm. One hopes. I will try to show that individuals often get outcomes they do not want, not because they have chosen wrongly, but because they have chosen instrumentally. <laughs> Thus, greater attention to the structure of inter interaction reduces the need for a theory of ideology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I got that one this time, Sinisemi, yeah, because I knew what you were saying. <sighs> Collective action problems. All right, and so here we're finally getting into the group uh, speak. How do you get caught up in a group here? The most common error that critical theories have made, in my view, is to make the outcome of a collective action problem for an effect of and for an effect of ideology. So they're making a collective action problem something that has to do with a, a certain concept or an idea. Collective action problems arise in situations where agents can best pursue their own goals and projects only by imposing some kind of cost upon others. The prisoner's di dilemma is the is the classic example. Each suspect can reduce his own expected jail time by turning in his partner. Doing so, however, increases the amount of jail time that his partner must serve. As a result, both suspects turn each other in, and so both serve more jail time than either would have if they had remained silent. It's the only problem with beer. It makes me burp. Many interactions involving large numbers of people have precisely the same structure. For example, most telephone companies did not use their bill not used to bill their customers for individual calls to directory assistance. Instead, customers paid for the directory assistance service as part of their basic monthly package. The problem with this arrangement is that it generates overuse of the service since the cost of serving any individual caller is paid by all of the firm's customers. So individuals who are too lazy to look up a number could get someone else to do it for them while effectively displacing the cost of this action onto others. But when everyone does this to each other, everyone winds up using more directory service and paying more for it than, to, than anyone actually wants to. Yeah, and you can see how old this paper is. Do you remember the last time anyone called a directory service? Yeah. Stopped billing, yeah. <laughs> you would know, wouldn't you, Rethius? But when everyone does it through, yeah. as a result, when phone companies switch to charging individuals directly for calls to directory assistance, the volume of car calls dropped dramatically. In a trial run in Cincinnati, imposition of a 20 cent per call charge reduced the average number of directory calls from 80,000 to 20,000 per month. As a result, average residential telephone rates dropped by 65 cents per month. Yeah, so... You know, I want, I'm sure there's another example of this nowadays, but I mean, who knows, like, if you told this to, like, a Zoomer, would they even know what calling directory ass assistance would mean? The most significant thing about these collective action problems, for the standpoint of critical theory, is that agents often have a hard time getting out of them, even if they realize that they are engaging in collectively self-defeating behavior. Well, how did anyone realize that they were engaging in self-defeating behavior there? It was the bill that was set by the company. The company should have known better. Yeah, they would definitely need like help. But I mean, you could def we. This is not a. Um, this is a common sort of thing. I think. I think the example, if they use it well, is fine. Like this is not an unusual situation. The reason is that the mere recognition that the outcome is suboptimal does not change the incentives that each individual has to act in a way that contributes to it. If I am not being charged per call, then even if I realize that I should not overuse a directory assistance, it does not mean that my phone bill will get any lower if I stop. Yeah, this is um, called the tragedy of the commons, where someone abuses a uh, common good. And so what happens is you get people that overuse it because it's not any one, no one per, like they don't have to pay for it. So it's like people overusing like the public field, they're just abusing the uh, public, uh, public works. And so they put the cost onto everyone else. Yeah, it's called the tragedy of the commons or the abuse of the commons, something like that. Yeah, tragedy of the commons would be better. I think that's like people have said this, like that's exactly what this is actually, this is the actual name for it. Yeah. Well, I've seen it in text before called that, Sinus Amiotics. Like I, I didn't make it up. Like 
you hit the uh, theoretical nail on the head. Not like I, I've just read it before. It is only if everyone stops that I will begin to see a difference. But I have no control over what everyone else does. And if and furthermore, if everyone else stops overusing the service, I can continue to do so. Then I am even better off. This is exactly tragedy of the commons. This is why it is called a collective action problem. In order to change the interaction, everyone has to stop doing what they have been doing. And often everyone must also believe that everyone else is going to stop. Yeah, this is, um, this is the, uh, if you guys know the GameStop uh, saga at the moment, this is what's happening. Everyone has to believe that everyone else is going to continue. And then the, um, eventually the hedge funds will have to collapse because they won't be able to borrow any more money. Um, yeah, so self-abuse of the commons. Yeah, that's fair. Like, in this case, the tragedy of the commons is abusing the, uh, individual here. Yeah. Masters of baiting? Yes, exactly. Masters of baiting. But yeah, so, like, this is what it is. So everyone has to act together. So, like, the GameStop, uh, is... Uh, saga at the moment is a current example of the tragedy of the commons in some sense where everyone is acting together because everyone realizes if they collectively act in one way it'll come out but everyone was already getting uh, abused in the other before everyone acted on GameStop it, they were all getting abused yeah so this, this is what I mean this is not an unusual thing and a lot of uh, issues around insurance also come up with this, like people who uh, insurance fraud. So you have to think of in terms of insurance fraud. This is how it always happens because you're p passing the bill on to all the other people who are paying for insurance. If you fraud every time you like, you know, have fraud in insurance, that person gets a big payout, but everyone else is paying for it. Okay. One very good clue that people are stuck in a collective action problem is when everyone knows that there is a problem, but nothing ever changes. <laughs> yeah, here we go. And we're finally getting political. For example, it is very common these days to hear complaints about the way a media circus develops around certain events or stories, such as the Lewinsky-Clinton scandal or the O.J. Simpson trial. One of the most commonly criticized characteristics of this pattern is the way that coverage achieves a saturation level. The clearest instance being when every major network is showing exactly the same thing, whether it be the OJ case, the OJ chase or Clinton's deposition. This is clearly sub a suboptimal outcome. If one channel is providing 24 hour live coverage of a particular story, then there is no point in having the others do the same. The same applies when every news program covers exactly the same five or six stories in their evening broadcast. <laughs> yeah, same thing when it's not fraud. Just saying, sure. <sighs> yeah, but you, this is like, this is funny. These old scandals seem so quaint nowadays. In any case, what is interesting about this criticism is that it is not just circulated in the broader public sphere. Yeah, well, that's the point, Cinesemiotics, is that everyone's paying for it. You have to build it in because you know some people are going to act that way. When the journalists who are actually providing the saturation coverage are asked for their views, they often say that the situation is ridiculous, that they that there are interesting stories to being ignored, etc. In other words, the problem is not that the members of the media have mistaken priorities or a poor understanding of what should be on television. They can see perfectly well what the problems are. The patterns persist because they are stuck in suboptimal equilibrium. Sa Stations compete with each other for viewers. Given a choice between a small portion of a large audience and a large portion of a small audience, it will often be best be in the best interest of broadcasters to choose the former, that is, a small portion of a large audience. Yeah. When all stations reason the same way, all will provide exactly the same coverage. The result is simply a waste of one or more broadcast frequencies. And what this is, is this is the race to the bottom in the media, is you're going for the small portion of a large audience this is the common denominator uh argument with a uh, reality tv once you can just get people watching the, the biggest amount of crap everyone's going to do the same thing because it costs the least amount of money and then all of a sudden everyone is showing uh reality tv because it gets a small amount of uh, a small portion of a huge audience who watches this stuff and it's entertaining and they like it but like uh the quality and variety of things on television has gone to crap and that's why we're on twitch watching other things thus the mere fact that people know that a certain social change would be in their interest broadly construed does not mean that they will have an incentive to do anything about it i may know that it is in our interest as telephone rate, rate payers 
or to use directory assistance in moderation, but that does not make it in my interest or your interest not to do so. In the same way, journalists may recognize that their entire profession loses credibility when, when behaving as a pack or pursue lurid stories, and so it is not in their interest, but it may still be in the interest of each individual reporter, each individual news organization to do so, since it is possible to increase one's share of viewers even when the total number drops. Exactly the same logic underlies negative campaign ads. Yeah, circumvented the actor's guilt. Yeah, I mean, that's what a scab is. I mean, you're going to get paid if you uh, break a, 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 a picket line. But, like, uh, it's you're ruining the collective action. So... From the outside, then, it may look as if people are confused about where their interests lie, that they are in the grip of some ideology. But upon closer examination, they turn out to be quite rational. They may even join the critical theorist in lamenting the sad consequences of their own actions. Okay, so here's the whole theory. Here's the whole fucking theory right here. It's that people are caught up in the race to the bottom because this is the only way that people, you know, get this is like in the short term. You can cheat the system in the short term in these collective action things. You can circumvent the Actors Guild and, be, uh, and uh, you know, break union dues. You can like screw over, um, uh, what's it called, insurance rates. Like you can do insurance fraud and then everyone else is, has to pay a thing or whatever else it is. Like, or you can be um, screwing over little investors because you know that the little investors won't turn around and like group against you, except nowadays they did in GME, uh, and, like uh, GameStop's, GameStop stock. So like this is the thing. Like this is what's going on. And they're saying people in the collective actions are not actually being irrational they're just not organized because they because of um whatever reason like the people the amount of organization that it needs to communicate with everyone and know everyone else is uh, gonna act in your best interest is extremely difficult to do how would you co communicate with everybody else or b um you just know in like the case of insurance or whatever like it's it's built into the actuarials that's not going to happen and so you don't care because like there's nothing you don't think there's anything you can do okay is that actually what's happening in the uh case of mass irrationality do we have people who are acting against their best interests because they're basically doing insurance fraud i don't fucking think so some of them are like the people uh, who run like Fox News, I think they think they are and they are happy to do so. They're trying to get um, they're trying to screw over like basically everyone else in order to get a bigger share of the crazy people. I don't think the pe I don't think people like they turn out to be quite rational and they may even join the critical theorist in lamenting the sad consequence of their own actions. I think that's crazy because all the people who do all these things, you think they're this reflective and they know what's going on. You think like the people who are like jumping up and down for like wanting to kill um like uh, Democrat politicians. You think those people are like the ones that are cheering that on the ones that attack the, uh, like uh the people who rioted on like the 6th on uh, january 6th you think they're like oh yes this was a collective action mistake this is like come on come on this is um yeah there's a few of them that probably like yeah i got caught up and i didn't realize that like we were all acting in this way together because it basically was a uh, weird collective action thing but yeah like no this does happen i just don't think the the phenomena that we are interested in and that they and that the author kind of put as the uh you know the catch line how do you do like these big group things like group irrationality this is a much more narrow phenomenon this is only like the people like the uh news reporters who know what they're doing that's the only group of people that's like okay we're screwing over our own uh industry by reporting the same schlock like that's it but like that's like you can count that number of people like just count them you can find the people that are doing it and that know they're doing it like there's only so many major networks so like you can find that number of people it's like it's gonna be like less than 200 like this is not a major phenomenon anyhow 
This analysis invites us to look back on some of the classic cases of ideology to see if something similar might not be going on there as well. Take the working class for, ex for instance. Once it was decided that workers would be better off under communism than under capitalism, many theories simply assumed that workers would go out and overthrow the system. The fact that they failed to show up at the barricades was felt to require some explanation. Ideology was the most popular candidate, so Marx suggested that they were the victims of commodity fetishism. They mistook the social relations between individuals for objective relations between things, and so they became convinced that the existing economic order was immutable. However, after half a century of Marxist critique, the working class still failed to make a revolution. Theorists began to suspect a deeper, more insidious form of ideology at work. The most popular diagnosis was consumerism. Workers had become seduced by the materialistic values of late capitalism and so failed to support the revolution because of a mistaken belief that they enjoyed living in suburban homes, using labor-saving appliances, eating TV dinners, etc. One thing that's interesting I just want to point out I hadn't. I don't know if I've seen late capitalism uh, referred to this early in like 2000. But this is interesting. This person is like, like, boom, late capitalism in 2000. That's kind of interesting that they were calling it late, late stage capitalism back then. These social criti critics simply fail to see the more obvious explanation. Revolutions are risky business. Setting up picket lines, not to mention barricades, is tiresome, difficult, difficult, often cold, and sometimes dangerous. Even if it were the were in the interest of the working class to bring about a socialist revolution, this does not make it in the interest of each individual worker to help out. There is no point going to the barricades unless thousands of your comrades intend to join you, but if thousands of your comrades are going anyhow, no one will miss you if you stay home. Revolutionary fervor can generate the solidarity needed to overcome this collective action problem in some instances, but in general there is no reason to think that workers will show any more solidarity with one another than phone company customers, and broad segments of the working class have consistently shown themselves willing to free ride off each other's collective achievements. This is why unions usually seek legally enforced closed shop arrangements. Okay. This is fair. Why don't you all go to war? If we all went to war, we could kick some ass. Well, war is dangerous, basically, and you might die. Um, and so, if we were all perfectly organized to go like do collective action, yes, we could do more great things. This is very hard, and the idea that like we're all not going to get ourselves stamped out by like some bigger force is very hard to know ahead of time. And so is this like really a collective action problem? Maybe. But like, I can see what this is. But I mean, I agree. The, the simple fact is that revolution is scary. Any level of change is scary. People don't like losing what they have. And so if you want to call, if the author wants to call that a collective action problem, okay. But the problem is, are they being irrational? No. But then again, they were being afraid is basically all that the author is saying here. And so, yes, can you call being afraid of like losing what you have a collective action problem? Yeah, but it's a little bit of a stretch. But like, I mean, I'll allow it, I guess. In this case, I'm being a little bit hostile to them. But like, it's kind of like they're calling, this is a very fancy way of saying, look, doing anything is scary. And like, all right. You want to call that a collective action problem? Yes, it can be described by a collective action problem, but it might also be able to be described by other things too. So this is an interesting question. Is social movements a collective action problems? Yes. Are you, And it's like, okay, here's really the problem then. The fact, this is starting from the position that like there is a better way to be. We don't actually know if there's a better way to be. The idea that like there's going to be a communist revolution and everyone's going to be better off, maybe, maybe that's the case. No one knows because we've not done a communist revolution in the United States or recently in like a uh, recent in uh, contemporary times, like post internet. I don't think anyone's done a communist revolution, only pre internet. And so the idea that like this is a collective action problem, it's like, yes, but that's assuming that this even makes sense saying that we know the outcomes. We don't know the outcomes here. And so the idea that we're saying, well, we haven't collectively acted to in our best interest is, well, we didn't actually know the outcome. So it's one thing to say that about like getting screwed over by the phone company. 
we're getting screwed over by the phone company. We know this. But in terms of like social change, we don't actually know that like the next regime is going to be better than the current regime. And that's a scary thought. Um, so there's a collective action problem, but there's also a crystal ball problem here. This person is assuming that we have, we're not collectively acting because we, um, we, we don't, we haven't like collectively, we're not collectively acting, acting because we just can't organize to get to the, like the, the promised land, but there might not be a promised land. And so that assumption is just like unfounded. So, you know, let me know if you have questions about that. Like, I, I don't know how well I said it, but it's strange that you're calling a collective action problem when you don't know the act, the outcome of the action. Okay. The myth of the beauty myth. Now consider a more controversial example. We often hear the complaint that cosmetics companies, the diet industry, industry plastic surgeons, and so forth exploit women. In the, mid, in the mid 90s, women in the United States spent around 20 billion a year on cosmetics, a sum that could have been used to finance 400,000 daycare centers or 33,000 battered women's shelters or 50 women's universities and so on. This is clearly a suboptimal outcome. Again, we don't know that. This person says this is clearly a suboptimal outcome. We don't know if all the women stopped using makeup all of a sudden what the actual outcome would be. We don't know that. Furthermore, the fact that men who earn more on average spend only a fraction on this amount maintaining their appearance and do not suffer much anxiety over their physical condition adds insult to injury. Again, this is weird 90s thought, but like there's probably just like nonsense nowadays, but they're just claiming like stupid misogynist crap because guys spend a lot of money on their appearance. But anyway, like dumb 90s beliefs. The difference is also widely felt to perpetuate a set of gender roles that are disadvantageous to women. Thus, feminists have have for a long time argued that women need to free themselves from their dependency on beauty and the beauty industry. Okay, and I, as far as I know, people are still annoyed with the beauty industry, but whatever. I mean, this is just, like, weird at the moment. But what has become most striking about this critique is that even though the vast majority of women accept it, it has little bearing on their personal conduct. Many women are perfectly capable, capable of denouncing the objectifying male gaze and distorted body image, while at the same time counting calories and drinking skinny lattes. This, again, with the, the, this is fair, but like, I, I'm just sensitive to people being like, oh, you have to drink less lattes nowadays. But this is 20 years ago, so that's a, a different time. This observation has led many feminist theorists to suggest that there may be, there must be an even more insidious form of ideology at work. If women understand the structure of their oppression and they can see how the cosmetics and fashion industry actively exploit them, then they must be out of their minds to drop hundreds of dollars on the latest moisturizer. Naomi Wolf basically suggests as much when she describes how, to reach the cosmetics counter, a woman must pass a deliberately disorienting prism of mirrors, lights, and scents that submit her to the sensory overload used by hypnotists and cults to encourage suggestibility. She claims that women experience an unconscious hallucination that female minds have been colonized, that women have been stunned and, distor <laughs> stunned and disoriented by changing gender roles, etc. In short, they are not acting rationality. How could they be so dumb? The answer is ideology. Women are so dumb because they, the establishment and its watchdogs share the cosmetic industry's determination that women are and must remain so dumb. Well, this is a nice slice of uh, history that would never get uh, written nowadays. <laughs> it's interesting. But like, okay, they're saying basically that women are just getting, uh, you know, their minds are getting taken over, colonized by the cosmetics industry and all the ideas. Now, to be fair, there's a lot of body shaming going on and all that sorts of stuff. Now, that does not make anyone dumb, but it does have an effect on people. Um, so, but like, this is just, uh, okay. However, the very fact that everyone has heard this critique a hundred times and yet nothing ever changes suggests that what we are dealing with is a collective action problem, not a problem of ideology. This is often overlooked in the case of beauty because the literature has a tendency to focus on the roles of ideals or archetypes in setting the standards. This distracts from the fact that beauty has an inherently competitive structure. Although standards of beauty vary from culture to culture, every culture has some kind of beauty hierarchy. 
People derive very significant material and social advantages from their position in this hierarchy. All right, so here's where we're at. See, all of this stuff up here was kind of nonsense, but this is where we're getting to the actual meat of the argument, and it's better. But I mean, this is like this complete nonsense up here about like, I don't know, maybe it's not nonsense, but like you just can't say this sort of thing nowadays. As a result, they can sig all right, so people derive very significant material and social advantages from their position in this hierarchy. As a result, they can significantly improve their quality of life by moving up a few levels. This is where the archetype model of, model of beauty proves misleading. The advantages of beauty do not flow to those who are beautiful in some absolute sense, but to those who are more beautiful than those around them. This is what generates the competitive structure. Moving up the beauty hierarchy means bumping someone else down. Yeah, so it, it's, um, they're saying here, beauty is kind of like a zero sum game. You win when, a, like, you win, someone else loses. And so then all of a sudden you gain all the benefits of being the most beautiful uh, person in the room. And so here's the question, though, for the author. Is this really a problem if we are inherently beauty oriented things? People like pretty stuff. We are beauty oriented beings. We like pretty people. We like looking at actors. We don't like looking at ugly people for the most part. So they're saying here basically that it's a collective action problem, but the collective action is going to deny our very like what it is to be people to like beauty. Like are you going to deny beauty? Is that what the answer to this is? That's not a collective action problem. That's a problem of like philosophy like how do you deny humans desire for beauty like that's a way different problem uh, author says none of this would be a problem if people were unable to amplify their natural endowments unfortunately cosmetics and plastic surgery makes it possible to synthetically reproduce some of the characteristics that are car considered beautiful as a result people have the ability to buy their way up the hierarchy this generates a classic collective action problem Consider the example of facelifts. Many women seek to make themselves look younger through artificial means. However old a person is entire however old a person looks is entirely relative. If a woman looks 50, it is only because when compared to other 50-year-old women, she looks about the same. This means that when a 50-year-old woman gets a facelift that makes her look 40, the action can be described in one of two ways. In a sense, she has made other herself look younger. But in another sense, all she has done is make all the other 50-year-old women in the population look a little older. Th these women may then be motivated to get a face, li a face lift just to retain position. I mean, yeah, you see this with all the, uh, in, like all the actors get facelifts uh, when they get older. I mean, a lot of the women do. So, and then because they're competing for the same uh, roles. And so when you look better, you, you, you eh. Because there's a, a limited number of roles, so it's a zero-sum game of who gets what uh, roles as an older woman. And so I think that this may have been driving the uh, a lot of facelifts in the acting industry. If this leads all the 50-year-old women to go out and get facelifts, then their behavior will be perfectly self-defeating. They will be right back where they started, all looking like 50-year-old women, except that now they will be paying a lot of money to look that way. This is clearly the dynamic at work in a number of different areas, as any resident of California can attest. Many women would be glad to stop wearing makeup, as long as every other woman stopped too. What they are not willing to do is to stop unilaterally, because the private cost would outweigh the private benefits. Wearing makeup is like standing up to get a better view at a ball game. You may be able to see better, but only by blocking the person behind you. As a result, once, more, once one person stands up, soon everyone else does too. Naturally, they would all be more comfortable sitting as they, would, eh, as they would be able to see just as well, but sitting down while everyone else, is, while everyone else stays standing is hardly an option. Yeah, the real housewives. Well, th this is true. Like, this is what happens. It's an arms race. That's what they're saying. This is a collective's arms race. And uh, escalation matters in this. So every time someone gets a slightly better, uh, you know, facelift, then that doctor becomes the it doctor. And everyone wants to run to that doctor because then they have, you know, done something that everyone else does. And so you've got an arms race here. Um, and I agree. This is a collective action problem. And is it bad because it, feeds into the um, cosmetics industry or is it bad because it feeds into human nature of trying to beat everyone else out 
and that's really the question here. The author here is blaming that, like, the uh, arms race and saying, well, everyone would know that, like, uh, we wouldn't want to do this and, like, it would be better if we didn't do it. I don't know. Like, the whole point of, like, looking better is because people think it matters. That's the problem. You're telling me that people are, like, not going to care about beauty anymore. That's like, yeah. This is different, like, in the ball game. Everyone wants to see, but that's a whole thing. You know? It's like, you don't get a better view by standing up in a ball game. You don't. You ev If everyone sits, it's the same. But if everyone stands, everyone has to stand. If you stand up at a ball game, your view doesn't get better. See, uh, here's exactly the problem. Right here. Wearing makeup is like standing up, standing up to get a better view at the ball game. Right here. Naturally, the old one. And then right here, they would all be able to see just as well if they were sitting. Like right here. The person contradict themselves within two sentences. And this is the problem. Seeing the ball at the ball game is not a natural good. Being beautiful is a natural good. Like in terms of philosophy, like there is seeing uh, the ball game is like okay. But like a natural beauty is a problem because that is a zero sum game because it is relative. And um, we value that. The ball game is different. This is like so even though this, this analogy is good, I would have been much happier with this as the original example. The problem is the author overstepped themselves they wanted to say more than they could and they um kind of overshot the mark because natural beauty is something that is just natural seeing a ball game is not natural so yeah but see like right here this is it it's like stand up to get a better view at the ball game but then right here they say see just as well so here's your problem so anywho i gotta drink more water anyway Conclusion: These examples are all of a case, are all cases where a, a collective action problem generates the illusion that some kind of ideology is at work. There are many other social inter interaction patterns that can generate the same effect. For example, for example, Terence Kelly's examples of agents who conform to institutional norms that disadvantage them in order to maintain trust relations reveal a similar phenomenon. Thus, the present analysis does not constitute a comprehensive theory. My goal has simply been to make a contribution to the project of, we of weaning social critics from their attachment to the concept of ideology. Okay, this is very reasonable. They're cutting down what they're trying to say above, saying, look, there are other explanations other than um, ideology. The stated motivation for the project has been the concern that through an excessive uncharitable attitude toward their subjects, critical theorists have had a tendency to undermine the credibility of their own views. In the background, however, has been another concern. Many social critics succumb to a sort of tacit cultural determinism. This is reflected in widespread assumptions that, the, that social practices directly reflect people's values or that they express some set of beliefs about how one should act. If this were the case, then the key to changing social institutions would indeed be to change people's values or beliefs. Unfortunately, while some social practices are directly patterned by the cultural system, many more are reproduced through the very loosely constrained strategic action. These interactions are integrated only indirectly, and so the associated outcomes may not reflect any specific set of values or beliefs. In this case, social criticism alone will not change anything. The more serious problem for critical theory arises as follows. As having presented the, criti the criticism and having it widely accepted, the critic expects to see some kind of social change. When there is none forthcoming, the critic begins to suspect not that, that there is a practical problem preventing implementation of the desired improvements, but that the criticism itself was too superficial that it did not get at the root of the problem. Perhaps the ideology was more pervasive than originally suspected. Perhaps the original criticism was insufficiently radical because it used concepts that were in general circulation, hence complicit in the ideological system. Perhaps the solution is to deconstruct these concepts and form an entirely new set. Once this line of thinking has been engaged, the critical theory becomes increasingly baroque, increasingly obscure, and of course increasingly unlikely to change anything. This can generate a vicious cycle of, th of theoretical self-radicalization in, in which critics respond to the increasing irrelevance of their theories by further radicalizing them, making the entire apparatus more and more remote from the concerns and vocabulary, vocabulary of everyday life. 
The goal of this paper has been to suggest one way in which critical theorists can engage in social criticism without generating this tendency to price themselves out of the market. Greater attention to the structure of social interaction, the practical me mechanisms, th mechanisms through which undesirable interactions pattern patterns are reproduced has the potential to generate more useful theoretical interventions. Okay, so in the end, I really, really was hoping this stuff right here, this vicious cycle of self-radicalization is what we were going to talk about. We ended up talking about some interesting stuff. I don't hate this paper. I think it's kind of a nice paper um, where they're saying, look, things, certain cases of uh, things where we don't like. It's because there's a short-term self-interested uh, tragedy of the commons at work. And it's not a question of theor uh, theoretical ideology that people are somehow under the guise of uh, some theory that has colonized their mind. Basically, you're acting in a short-term way because you can't socially organize to change an entire industry. Like, if we could change the entire um, way we like treat people we don't treat good looking people better than we treat ugly people then all of a sudden the cosmetics industry would collapse but the fact is we do treat good looking people better than we treat ugly people and so the cosmetics industry preys upon this they use this to you know give you a small step up and so that you get a small step up in social status when you look better and the question here is is this the cosmetics industry like doing something to us or is this um, a social interaction thing? Now, the author is saying this is a social thing. I'm saying, look, this is just how people are. And the cosmetics industry has glommed onto that. But there will be cases like this. I, I agree that there will be times when we all like are getting abused by a system like Wall Street, or exa for example, and we aren't all organizing. And then all of a sudden some apes on the internet got together and decided they were going to bankrupt a few uh, hedge funds by buying up all of uh, GameStop stock. They were able to do something about it through the collective action of the internet, which is interesting. And that actually shows that there is um, something to this because it can be overcome when there is a social movement like that. But if, if you were to say that the people were too stupid and too happy about the situation under capitalism, and that's why they let um, Wall Street run wild, well, you would also be right, but not all the time. And so the, the, what this author is saying is, yeah, it's a narrow situation, but you need the few people, who, you, you need enough people who are reflective about what's going on and that they realize that there is a social interaction problem and then they are willing to do something about it to actually get it to work. Now, do you think you could tell the average investor that they are getting screwed over by um, Wall Street? Maybe, maybe not. Most people are not going to jump on the GameStop train. You, I mean, do you, you hear people talk about this stuff sometimes in the media and they're telling you how horrible uh, what's going on is but from the position of the um, of like the, of the big investors. Now, are they paid shells? Maybe. Or, or do they just not understand? Maybe that's the case, too. And that's the same thing. Like some people buy into the crap. Some people don't. Some people that don't. Well, that realize the situation they're in and they're trying to make the best of it those are the people that this this article is about i don't know how many of them are, there are now if they if the author had actually talked about you know stop getting yourself into some nonsense like uh where you keep um making crazier and crazier theories to say oh this is more and more insidious how does that actually work? This was really what I was hoping they would talk about. How do these insidious ones actually work when they do work? Not when that people realize it's wrong, but when they actually do uh, wrong. When they actually do mess people's heads up. That's what's really interesting here. It would have been really interesting, and I think what we were hoping for. But instead, we got the narrow one of the self-reflective people who realize, oh, I'm getting caught up in this and it's bad, but there's nothing else I can do about it because that's the way society is, society is or humans are right now. Anywho, okay. Anything else uh, from the from chat about this one? I don't think I have anything else to say. <laughs>